This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 253, recorded on October 14, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Hi there. How are you? Okay. You Okay. Also joining us from Washington, D.C., Michelle Swanson. Hello. Good to be with you. From Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. I, sometimes I want to say North Carolina, but <laughs> you know, I know that's wrong. We were all one state at one point in time, and then we got divided. Uh, and we have a guest today from... Uh, the fair city of St. Louis from Washington University, Petra Levin. Welcome to TWIB. Yeah, thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you, Petra, for joining us. Uh, we were going to talk a bit about uh, some of the work from your laboratory. But before you, we do that, let's uh, find out a little bit about you. I've been trying to figure out from your accent and where you're from, but I can't place it. Where are you from? <laughs> um, I grew up in New England in uh, Amherst, Massachusetts. Oh, okay. um, and yeah, so in Western Massachusetts, I get asked a lot when I tell people in the Midwest, I'm from Massachusetts, they ask, why don't you have a Boston accent? And I'm like, people from the other side of the state yeah. don't have that accent. And I even got asked that when I was in Boston by people from Boston, as if the other half of the state doesn't exist. So Okay. And, and uh, where did you go to college? I went to a small college in the northwest corner of Massachusetts called Williams College, oh, which yeah. is a liberal arts school. Clark, it, Clark Massachusetts, right? <laughs> it's uh, Williamstown. Yeah, the Clark Williamstown. Art Institute is there. Yeah. Many people only know the Clark. But yeah. Yeah, it's, it's so great. beautiful there. So beautiful it, in the it fall. It is so beautiful. Um, so beautiful. I have to say that that's the one college that rejected me when I was applying. I mean, this would be in the 70s. Williams rejected me. It's a tough school. Small and competitive, yeah. 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 But I guess I, I I did well not to go there because I probably wouldn't <laughs> have been a virologist. Who knows? Who knows? So were you interested in science in college? Um, I was – actually, I have a 17-year-old now, and I was thinking she's pretty undifferentiated, and I came up <laughs> with two things I wanted to do when I went to college. So I would say I was also undifferentiated. My father is a scientist, so I had basically felt like I should major in biology, um, and mm -hmm. I thought maybe I might be pre-med, and then quickly decided I didn't want to be pre-med. Uh, well, it took me about until my sophomore year, and then I'm like, I really just find this whole idea of just working for grades and trying, the whole pathway was so not kind of what I wanted to do. I just wanted to understand the science, and so that kind of shifted me towards, you know, doing biology, and I had some great teachers. Um, and then my other thing I was interested in was Russian. I was going to do Russian language. And my freshman year taking, I think I was taking second year Russian and trying to learn all the Russian language and then also Russian grammar is kind of um, difficult. And then trying to memorize all this stuff for intro bio, it was just too much. <laughs> and so I ended up doing a Soviet and Eastern European studies minor along with uh, the bio major. What kind of science did your dad do? He is a population geneticist. He works in bacteria. Oh, so. okay. Wow. Not cool. too far. Apple does not far. What is it? Not <laughs> I know. I, far tried from the tree. I tried really hard to do something different. <laughs> <laughs> so as a kid, were you like in like stuffing pipette boxes or, you know, doing that kind of routine lab work? <laughs> um, as an older kid, as a younger kid, and my brother, who's actually a um, wood fire potter, he's an artist. He and I used to spend time waiting for my dad to be done in lab. That was kind of where we were supposed to hang out and wait. And so I just saw it a lot as a place I just wanted to go home and read a book <laughs> and not be in lab. Um, as an older kid, I did some lab work. Uh, I think the least glamorous thing I did was uh, he did some project where he was seeing if E. coli would grow in urine, and I had to do serial dilutions in sterile urine, which... Mm. 
with mouth pipetting? With, with... No, no. <laughs> uh, then you're much younger than than I. I was yeah. definitely post mouth pipetting. Definitely mm. post mouth pipetting. Petra, so. you must uh, you must know, or you may know, that one of my co-hosts on Twiv is from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Oh yeah. He identifies. He's from not too far outside of Springfield. Right. So that's, um, I grew up, Amherst is about 40 minutes, maybe a little less from yeah. Springfield. So. And did you immediately go to grad school after college? I did not. So that was the other thing. I wasn't sure I wanted to go to graduate school. And so I decided that I wanted to try, I, I knew I wanted to teach. So that was very important to me. And so I looked for jobs teaching at high school. And the job I got was teaching in Switzerland at the American School in Switzerland, which is in Lugano, Switzerland. Mm. And I taught seventh and eighth grade science and ninth grade earth science uh, to kind of a mix of American kids who had grown up in the Middle East um, on like their parents worked for mobile oil or maybe the military. And there weren't any schools for them, especially in Saudi. So they had to come and go to boarding school in Switzerland, which was you know, maybe not ideal, but um, then I also lived with ninth grade boys and 11th grade girls. And it was a great experience. I got to see a lot of Europe. I learned a lot about how to deal with teenagers, which has been useful lately as my kids enter their teenage years. But uh, I also decided I really needed to teach older kids, <laughs> maybe even <laughs> college students. And um, so after that year, I, I during that year, actually, I applied to grad school and I visited schools. I, I came and I visited one university and I liked it and I got in and just traveling back and forth to Switzerland and trying to teach was, I'm like, I'm done. So I didn't even visit more than one school mm. or grad school. So you're in Switzerland about a year. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's, that's fun to be in Europe out of college. I think a lot of people would like to do that. So what grad school did you end up going to? I ended up going to Harvard. Mm -hmm. um, I, wanted to study. I'd had a great teacher who did developmental biology, Marsha Altschuler, in college. And I actually, my undergrad advisor worked on Bacillus subtilis uh, DNA repair, uh, Chip Lovett. And I loved both of them so much. And they were both fantastic teachers. And I mm -hmm. came to grad school thinking I was going to work on development, probably in frogs. Um, and uh, the program I was in was a developmental biology program kind of smushed together with biochemistry and molecular biology. It had this really long name, BMCDB and um, BMBCDB, something like that. And so uh, I got there and did not end up working in frogs at all. Whose lab did you go to? Um, I ended up in Rich Losick's lab. Mm -hmm. So uh, Rich, uh, I, it was, I ended up on that rotation in part because he interviewed me and in part because I'd worked on Bacillus in college. Um, and um, it was great because uh, he it just kind of led the way his lab was run. Each person had their own project. And the person in charge of me, Peter Margolis, my rotation advisor, was just a wonderful geneticist. And I'd always liked genetics, but Peter showed me what you could do in Bacillus and you could hmm. you could really manipulate its genome so easily. And I saw like you could do all these amazing things. And after doing that and doing those experiments, even though I did two other rotations, I was like, I was really hooked. And the lab was then a really, it was a great environment. It was a super, it was a big, medium-sized lab. And everybody really was supportive and doing exciting things. And Rich is excited about anything. You can bring him a gel. Like, a, oh, look, I cut DNA. And he'd be super enthusiastic. <laughs> which, as a beginning and you could do developmental thing. biology with the full <laughs> subtlest, right? Exactly. And I could do development. So I could use genetics, which at the time you couldn't do in frogs at all. So, What did you work on in his lab? Um, I... Worked on, um, I actually got to kind of, I was became really fascinated. So bacillus, when it develops, it, it stops dividing. Normally, it's a rod-shaped organism. It divides in the middle to make two equivalently sized daughter cells. So two equal daughter cells, just like E. coli does. But when you starve it and it's sporula, it sporulates, it has this very elaborate developmental program in which you go from one sigma factor, it's called a sigma factor cascade that turns on a different, at least the activation of a different sigma factor. But a key step in this process, which is sort of a developmental thing, is you go from one cell type that divides asymmetrically. So it puts down a septum near one pole of the cell and the small cell becomes the spore 
and the other cell is called the mother cell. And the mother cell engulfs the spore. So you end up with the spore inside the mother cell. And the spore has a certain genetic program that dehydrates it and it wraps up its DNA and protects it. And the mother cell makes this coat that coats the spore. And then the mother cell dies, <laughs> kind of like Baron did, right? You're like, <laughs> release the spore and then that's it. Um, but the part of that process, so Rich's lab worked on all the steps in that process, but I was really intrigued by how you go from medial to polar septation. Why do you switch? And how, what is the program to switch? And I had this great idea. I was going to figure it out as a grad student. And I think we still don't understand why it stops dividing in the middle. It shut, seems to shut down that middle site and then activate these sites at the poles. But um, that was my project was really to understand that. And I was able to kind of identify which transcription factors were required for that switch. Um, and I learned a lot of cell biology. So at that time, Rich's lab had two postdocs, Kip Pagliano and um, Elizabeth Harry, who both run their own labs now. Um, and they were really instrumental. And in, I think I would say they, I would credit them with starting a lot of this idea that you can look at single cells, single bacterial cells and look at subcellular structures. And so they were localizing things in bacteria using fluorescence microscopy. And I kind of piggybacked on that to look at FTSD localization, this protein that forms where the division septum is. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to see it using fluorescence. Joe Lekenhaus had seen it a few years before using immunogold. But to be able to see it in a lot of bacteria and measure them and was really incredible. And it's really because I just happened to be in the right place and have these two amazing postdocs, now faculty, who'd really push this technology. And it really is, I think, a good example of how just a couple of people can make a whole change in the way we think about organisms. We had Kit and Joe on TWIM some time ago. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. A lot of fun. I can see where some of the figures in your current papers come from now. All the way back then, you can see some of the origins, right? Kind of the exactly. architecture of bacterial cells. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, one of your co-authors on the shrinking paper, Fred Chang, who used to be here. He used to be my colleague here at Columbia. And I always remember his lab talking about, how do you know where to put the dividing point? Where, how does the <laughs> cell know? <laughs> He's still in any organism. I think that's still like a big <laughs> mystery. And yeah. yeah, I mean, happy to talk about what we think in bacteria is not what my lab works on right now, but um it's uh it's still definitely a like hmm. still a I mean they're I think it's more like it's just the sum of a whole bunch we always say they're corralling, it's like pushing those proteins to mid cell. There's mm. a lot of negative regulation in bacteria that kind of keeps it away from the places it doesn't want. And but you mm. we you know, when I got into this we thought there'd be one protein that's turned on at mid cell and then it tells FTSD where to go. But then you'd have to take another step back and be like, Well, what tells that protein where mm -hmm. to go? Just turtles the chicken all the way down. And the egg. Absolutely. It's, I would say it's turtles all the way down, right? <laughs> um, turtles all the way down, exactly. What did you do after this? Uh, hard to top this PhD, it sounds. Um, I Well, okay, so Michelle knows this story. So I was originally going to go into bacterial pathogenesis. Um, that was where everybody I knew who came out of kind of microbial phys went. And, but I was so attached to my project, and I hadn't solved the problem, right? I'd only identified the transcription factors. Um, and um, so I sort of a last minute after sort of turning and almost going to Tufts to work with Ralph, who was wonderful, I decided to work with Alan Grossman at MIT. Um, mm. And Alan was actually trained by Rich. So this is super incestuous. And Alan um, basically let me do what I wanted in his lab. He wasn't really working. He was doing some DNA replication work, but he, he hadn't done any uh, cell biology yet. And um, it was great to go to that lab too, because I, as a postdoc, was allowed to basically do what I wanted. Um, and also, Alan is just a great advisor. He's very calm. He was never excited to see gels where you'd cut DNA. He wasn't interested in that at all. Um, and so that took a little getting used to, but he wanted to talk for a long time. He was happy to talk about science for a long time, right? Yeah. And and that was also wonderful because we'd talk through everything. And uh, about all the details. And so that was also a really great experience. So Ralph is Ralph Isberg, I presume, from Tufts, yeah. right? Yeah. Yes. And Ralph was was, was Alio the chair of that department when you were looking at that? He was. I don't, 
He was? He yeah. was. <laughs> huh. yeah. um, Alio, do you remember Ralph? Sure. <laughs> Uh, what did you do after that, uh, Petra? Um, so after uh, Alan's lab, I well, I applied for jobs and um, I got a job here at WashU. So I've been here since 2001 at Washington mm-hmm. University. Um, and I interviewed at med schools and I interviewed at, uh, so I'm on the arts and sciences side. So I'm on the college side. Um, and I was definitely drawn to uh teaching undergrads so I've Mm. been that's been watch you allowed me to do research I was also the first time I was in a department uh, so I'm in a biology department we have you know it's a big biology department but because watch you has so much microbiology it was the first time I'd been in a place with a lot of microbiology because we have a very big micro department a really good micro department and so there's a lot of microbiology pathogenesis non-pathogenesis kind of across campus and Mm. so it seemed like a really good fit. I mean, it's a really good fit. Hmm. So. And what were some of the biggest differences moving from Massachusetts <laughs> to the Midwest? Aside from better coffee. <laughs> Aside from better coffee in the Midwest <laughs> or Massachusetts? Now I'm in, in, in Washu. <laughs> um, so I think, so my mom's family's from Detroit and, and then lived in, lived in Ohio. So I was a little familiar with the Midwest. Um, I think it's much easier to drive here than Boston. I think that's a Boston <laughs> yeah. specific thing. I don't remember like Amherst having particularly difficult right. driving. Uh, people are are very polite, um, but maybe you don't always know what they're thinking. And in Boston, you always know what they're thinking. You know, they they <laughs> they may not be polite, but they're honest. I guess in terms of like just interactions. And here, everybody is polite, which is which is really nice. Um, it's just a different kind of feel. Um, it was much like we can afford to buy a house with that had a yard. That was also nice. Um, and other than that, I think I haven't noticed that much, but again, I'm from kind of this college town in Massachusetts. So it's a little bit different feel, um, than Boston. I don't know, Michelle, what you found when you moved to the Midwest. I I can remember when I moved um, back to the Midwest and asked, um, somebody at a clerk in a grocery store, you know, where can I find the relish? They would stop what they were doing, put things down, and then <laughs> escort me over and stop and, like, consider the different options. <laughs> and at That's first true. I thought, like, I'm not an idiot. Just tell me what aisle. But now, now I'm used to it. We chat. It's, it's very nice. There is more chatting, for sure. Lots more chatting. Definitely. Yeah. And I, it took me a while to get used to chatting. So, so Petra, when you first uh, started your lab, what, was, what were some of the goals uh, that you wanted to address back then? Um, so when I started my lab, um, so the work I'd done in Alan's lab, it, it, I thought I would keep working on sporulation, and I just kind of kept hitting brick wall after brick wall. And fortuitously, um, the grad student who was next to me, Catherine Lemon, she had just started fusing GFP to everything. So this was sort of the advent of GFP. And GFP, it turns out, is is actually kind of brilliant because it doesn't fold very well at higher temperatures. So at like mm. 42, it doesn't fold very well. And so I, she's like putting it on DNA polymerase. So I'm like, I'll just put it on FTSE and see what happens. And so I put it on FTSE and bacillus, which is a trivial experiment in, since it's so easy to integrate. And so all the copies of FTSE in E. coli, sorry, in bacillus were fused to GFP. Mm. And what turned out to happen was not only did the cells live, which was kind of a surprise since FTSC is this tubulin-like protein and it has to polymerize end to end in order to function. So even with this big 22 kilodalton GFP fluorescent protein hanging off of it, it still worked. Mm. But the cells became temperature sensitive for division. So the cells became heat sensitive for division. And I used that, we sort of leveraged that to look for mutations that extragenic mutations that allowed bacillus to grow and divide at the non-permissive temperature, which actually in this case was 45. And we found a lot of inhibitors of division. And so when I started my lab, we started characterizing those inhibitors Hmm. of division. And so we started with, so the protein identified as a postdoc was called Ezra for extra Z rings. Uh, We identified clip X. So this chaperone is actually the part of the CLIP uh, XP chaperone that can, sorry, it's the CLIP XP protease that can identify 
different targets. So clip X, if you knock out clip X in Bacillus, um, you get, it, it can actually, losing clip X suppresses the heat sensitivity of this FTSC GFP TS thing that we had created. And so we characterized clip X in that regard. And it turned out that clip X actually interacts directly with FTSC, which actually Tanya Baker had found in just pull downs and uh, it inhibits FTSC assembly. So that was kind of the first thing we did. Um, and we also identified a protein that inhibits FTSC that's sensitive to carbon availability. So it inhibits FTSC assembly when the cells are growing in a good carbon source like uh, LB, LB glucose. And when your cells are growing in a poor carbon source like minimal sorbitol, which Bacillus doesn't like, uh, that protein is inactivated and doesn't inhibit FTSC. And so the cells divide more easily when they're growing in a poor growth medium than in a carbon rich medium. And so that protein was coupling cell length to carbon availability. So that was really also exciting. And then some of the other work we did was just trying to understand how FTSC assembly was regulated, kind of a little bit, <laughs> uh, how FTSC assembly is regulated um, because cells that are growing fast have to divide more. So, for example, if you're doubling every 20 minutes, that means you have to make an FTSC ring and put up the cell division machinery on top of it and divide every 20 minutes. So you're just going to make more division machinery more frequently. And if you're growing in nutrient poor medium like Sorbitol, where you have like a 60, 70 minute mass doubling time, you're only going to divide every 60 or 70 minutes. And so we wanted to know whether the concentration of FTSC changed uh, in those conditions. And if we could override it, maybe we could make the cells divide more if we overexpressed FTSC. And so those experiments were really fun because we were just essentially repeating the kind of classic Schechter work in Bacillus, looking to see if FTSC levels hmm. changed, like in slow growth, maybe there wasn't that much. And then in fast growth, maybe there was a lot. And it turned out that the amount of FTSC, the concentration in the cells was the same, at uh, both slow growth and fast growth. And so what was changing was whether FTSC was sort of activated to form the basis for the cell division machinery or not. So it was regulated at the level of assembly, not at the level of concentration or production. Have you had a lot of uh, undergrads uh, doing research in your lab? I would, I would think so, right? Um, I usually have two or three undergrads in the mm. lab. And that's also been, I think, great. Um, We've had some who have done, who really contributed to uh, some of our, our major papers. Mm -hmm. um, on the paper, for example, that I think we'll talk about later, um, that was actually an undergrad, um, Jesse Cow, who actually had seen the shrinkage for the first time, and he oh, didn't cool. know what was going on. Hmm. Um, and so That's I always have- best. a that's the best because they say, what's, what's going on? Exactly. Did I do did something I do? wrong? Cool. Um, I, I, I do want to move on to the talk about these papers. Um, but I, I just want to ask, what do you teach there? What courses? So I teach two classes right now. I used to teach the micro lecture. I taught that mm -hmm. for about 15 years. And then I switched to teaching a undergrad class, um, we didn't have any pathogenesis classes. So we teach, I teach a class, it's a writing intensive class called Infectious Disease History, Pathology, and Pathogenesis. And it's uh, usually 12 students or less. So it's one of the few classes our students take that small. Um, and usually, except for the past couple of years, we've always just gone through sort of the history of infectious disease. We try to do classic papers. Mm -hmm. um, we'll do a, one of the yellow fever papers, Walter Reed's yellow fever papers. Uh, we do this classic tuberculosis paper that pro proved its uh, TB is airborne. Mm -hmm. um, and we do some more recent papers as well. And so we're trying to teach the students how to read papers and think critically. Um, and then they also write a lot. So the writing intensive part is they write summaries of the first set of papers uh, like kind of like you have when you write a review, right? You have a 250 word kind of summary of the paper you just read. 
Um, and they also learn to write specific aims. So that was the last project we just did. So they have to write specific aims page like you'd have in the front of an NIH grant where you have your sort of summary and significance and then your hypothesis or question and your experiments. Um, and then they uh, will end up right now by rewriting a 3000 word review kind of um, of something they're interested in. Uh, related to infectious disease. And that's supposed to be really aimed at a lay audience. So, I mean, they're not at Ed Young's level, but the idea would be something like that Ed Young would write for the Atlantic or something you might read in the New Yorker or in the New York Times. So that kind so of- So are these, are these junior seniors microbiology majors? Because that sounds pretty sophisticated. These are juniors and seniors. We do not have a microbiology major. We have mm -hmm. a microbiology track where if they take- intro micro in this class in a micro lab, they can be on the track. All of the students are doing Bio 500, which is our research intensive, like undergraduate research. Mm -hmm. Are you much connected with the microbiologists elsewhere on campus at the medical school and so forth? I have a lot of interactions with micro on the med campus. I've been, I've had students from that program in my lab. I'm on a prelim next week for one of them. Um, in pre-COVID times, I went over there probably once every couple of weeks or twice, you know, to go to seminars or serve on thesis committees. Now we do by Zoom. Um, right now we have, we started working in Klebsiella and um, David Rosen works on Klebsiella. He's a professor over there. And so he's been giving us all his strains. And he's, it's actually, I love David because it's like dealing with Rich. He's enthusiastic about everything we find. So. <laughs> and you collaborated with Scott Holkren on this triclosan paper too, didn't you? Yeah, so Scott's lab, um, actually Anna Flores Morales, who's now at Notre Dame, was a postdoc in that lab. And she did the mouse work for us. She's wonderful. Um, and so she did the mouse work for us um, on that paper. So we have a couple of papers that I'd like to to touch on each um, in the next half hour or so, just to give listeners a flavor. And I, you mentioned the first one, the starvation induces shrinkage of the bacterial cytoplasm. I'd love to hear. Sounds like an interesting entree into that problem. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think this paper, I guess the motto of my lab is, well, the kind of overarching objective of my lab is to really kind of pick apart how the environment impacts the growth physiology and now more recently antibiotic resistance of bacterial cells. And we hmm. did this experiment for reasons that are obscure <laughs> and a little hard to explain, but the basic idea was we wanted to know how cells respond to sudden starvation. And our general idea was our cells that are larger better able to survive sudden starvation because they can kind of cannibalize themselves, right? Mm -hmm. If you're a big, long cell, you have a lot of proteins, you can use those proteins to survive longer. And if you're a small cell, maybe you won't respond that well to sudden starvation. So that Simply was, put, is it better to be fat than skinny? Yes, yes. <laughs> is it better to be fat? Even if you're not actually full of fat, you're full of protein, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, um, bacteria don't make much fat. They they are the true lean machines. They just get longer. Certainly, E. Uh, coli for sure does not store yeah. anything normally as as lipids. Huh. Um, and so the experiment was pretty dead simple. Uh, Jesse, the undergrad, and Corey Westfall, who was Jesse Cow, the undergrad, and Corey Westfall, who was a postdoc in the lab, they. Instead of starving, normally you sort of do nutrient depletion or maybe you resuspend without nutrients. They washed the cells so they didn't have anything stuck to them and they put them in M9 salts. So essentially the salts you would use for minimal medium without any carbon source. So, and because my lab, whenever we, and then they were going to just look at survival over time, but my lab we always look at them in the microscope. It's just kind of a routine thing that we always do. And when they did that, they saw this really unexpected phenotype in phase contrast microscopy, just on normal phase. Kind of you, most any lab that micro lab that has a microscope almost always has a phase scope. You could see that the phase dark region, which is the cytoplasm, had gotten smaller, but then you had this phase light region at one pole, which normally you don't see. And that turned out to be kind of a, the paraplasm had gotten bigger. Well, the paraplasm had gotten bigger at the expense of the cytoplasm. 
So poor Jesse must have thought there was something wrong with the microscope. He, he's looking at this cell and he's saying, this is just strange. And you have some incredible pictures in, in that PNAS paper that you offer so people can actually look to see what we're talking about. Yeah, it looks incredible. I think Jesse thought and Corey thought because it. Corey's like, well, what is this? Have you ever seen this? And, and my first thought was maybe it's from spinning the cells, but we spin the cells all the time, right? In the microfuse, especially in this case, we had to wash them, but we do that. That's not an unusual thing for us to do. And I couldn't remember any experiment. Um, and it turned out not to be the spin. Um, and so we were, we were left with this phenotype that we'd never seen before. And we kind of combed through the literature and actually a paper that had said that bacteria need peptides Today, since these things that just break up proteins to survive long term, had one EM picture. We actually cite this paper. It's a paper, I think, from like 1984, um, where you can see it's an EM and you can see that the periplasm is bigger and it's a cell that's starved for a week. And that was the only example we could find of anything. And they kind of threw that in that paper. I don't think that phenomenon, it wasn't the focus of the paper. And so we had this phenomenon that nobody had seen. And we just started asking people, had they seen it? What is this? And then just trying to just poke at it because we couldn't even, yeah, we just had no, there was no baseline for it. It looked a little like sporulation, but there was no new division or anything. So it must have been such an exciting day when you did the experiment (laughs) where you loaded the paraplasm with the red fluorescent protein and the cytoplasm with green fluorescent protein and then saw that concentration at the pole that was beautiful it's beautiful yeah no that's a beautiful experiment so this work that was actually done in casey's lab so i kept asking people i asked john cronin who sat next to me on an nih study section so john works on lipids i'm like have you ever seen anything like this and he hadn't he thought maybe everything's just scrunching up to like concentrate but um i went to a meeting actually not too long after i'd done this an asm meeting they used to have this awesome prokaryotic development conference and I was watching a talk from Casey Wong's lab. So Casey's a physicist, biophysicist at Stanford, who's just wonderful and super creative. And his grad student at the time, Hanzo Shi, had put up um, a slide. They had a mutation in a gene called MLA that kind of imba- made an imbalance between where lipids went, whether they go to the outer membrane or the inner membrane. And the phenotype of these MLA mutants, when they put them under certain conditions, looked exactly like what I had seen, that wow. what Jesse had seen and Corey had seen, this kind of extra big paraplasmic space. And I texted him in the middle of session, which is probably not the best example. <laughs> Don't do this at home, kids. But, um, and, and I'm like, I think we need to talk. And so that started it. And then Casey had, because he'd done this MLA stuff and Han Duo had done this work with this uh, protein for lipid homeostasis between the two membranes. He and Handwo actually did that experiment with the the M cherry, and it is gorgeous. So that's and that how was, the collaboration got started. A conversation at a meeting, huh? That's by great. Text. By that's text. That's great. <laughs> yeah, it was. It's actually a really. It's a great collaboration. I mean, we have other collaborations now, so um, it was a really good start. And also because they had all these tools. And we had a lot of genetics. It was a really good combination because we kind of balanced each other out. Um, right, right. They could do the biophysical stuff and we can do some more of the genetics and analysis. So you make this statement that the, the shrinkage is, is primarily driven by water loss, right? Right. How do you figure that out? So the way we know it's driven by water loss is because you can find the dry weight of the cells Mm -hmm. and so their dry weight didn't really change before and after shrinkage but you can measure actually this is a fantastic technique Mm -hmm. it's a it's a phase contrast technique so phase contrast is actually looking at differences in density between your cell and whatever you put it on top of and you can use change essentially use that to estimate the density of whatever you're looking at. So using mm-hmm. that, Handwo was able to come up with the density of the cytoplasm and how much it changed. We also used the GFP fusion to look at increases in GFP kind of intensity concentration. Mm-hmm. And then because the dry weight doesn't change and the density, inc- the density increases, the only option is, is probably lost water. 
and painstaking genetic analysis that ruled out multiple other mechanisms, right? <laughs> yes. Taking advantage of the genetics. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, exactly. Thank goodness for the KO collection, because yeah, we tried everything. We tried all the things we know are involved in, you know, stationary phase, starvation response. So PP, GPP, magic spot. So the stringent response was not important. RPOS and these genes involved in, um, you know, also entry into stationary phase and stabilizing cells in stationary phase. ATP depletion didn't affect it either. It <laughs> Nothing. Just... <laughs> yeah. Um, we, yeah. And so we, we still are left with this, what is going on and what, how is it working? Uh, we have some ideas that we're testing, but um, it was a really, I've never studied something where I couldn't just get a genetic handle on it. So it didn't require protein synthesis. It didn't, require lipid synthesis. It didn't require um, transcription. And so it looks like, yeah, so it is just water leaving and how now we're just looking into things that might make water leave because the cells are already under tremendous turgor pressure. And so you're essentially, by mm -hmm. doing this, it must be really advantageous because they're essentially making it worse. Um, and so there's probably, my, our theory is that they're putting things into the paraplasm um, that might draw water out, like large sugars. Hmm. That's our current model of okay. what's going on. Yeah, I was going to ask. So, how what did, would be the selective advantage of putting an energy source in the periplasm when you're starving? Right. So that is a good question. Um, actually, for a long time, it's been known that E. coli and other gram-negative bacteria put these things called periplasmic glucans, which are these big sugars out there. And they are sometimes called osmoregulated periplasmic glucan uh, for some kind of osmo protection. Um, but they also haven't been studied very much. I think there's one lab that's basically studied them uh, in more recent times. And um, the only idea is it's much under sudden response condition. It's worth putting the sugar out there to get it done. In this case, I think John Cronin is probably right. So John is a awesome. Uh, a lot of what we know about lipids comes from John Cronin's lab at University of Illinois. And I think he's right. His suggestion to me at study section was that um, the cell is concentrating what's inside. So by getting rid of water, it can concentrate whatever it has left when it's suddenly starved and it doesn't have time to adapt. So it can kind of keep the concentration of its metabolites high. So it can actually do enough catabolism to adapt and eventually survive. So essentially it's like a sudden response, like, okay, dump the water so we can finish the reactions we started and maybe respond to stress and protect ourselves. So you do find that this shrinkage requires what you, what is called the toll pal system. So I wonder if you could explain that, what that is. Okay. So that is a great question. Um, <laughs> toll pal um, is a, set of proteins that spans from the inner membrane to the outer membrane in the paraplasm of a lot of most gram negative. So um, TOLPAL is involved in a lot of things. It coordinates actually some efflux pumps, a lot of processes that need to expand the paraplasm. TOLPAL system is important for that. And it turns out that for shrinkage to happen, we don't need TOLPAL. So TOLPAL mutants still exhibit mm this paraplasmic expansion, but what they cannot do is recover. I so see. a toll pal mutant, when you give it nutrients again, it, it basically, you don't really see recovery. What you see is the cell, maybe it just kind of starts to bleb and then it, it kind of just explodes. And this is actually, toll pal has been a little mysterious. I think mutations in toll pal have that word that I try to avoid in my lab too much because it's scary pleiotropic. They're <laughs> known to be very pleiotropic, right? They have a lot of problems. One of their problems is recovery from stationary phase. And we think that part of that is due. So we see this shrinkage. Actually, Han Duo, using this amazing M cherry fusion, saw that you get shrinkage in stationary phase. It's just too small to resolve on a normal light microscope unless you have a little help from a fluorescent protein fusion. And um, when tall palmutants have a problem in recovery from stationary phase, and it probably it looks like just looking at the cells recovering the tall palmutants, 
they seem to look just like our starved cells on recovery. A lot of them bleb and start to die. So that might explain at least one of the pleiotropic Tolpal mutant phenotypes. Did you try this with Subtilis? Uh, Subtilis sporulates. Gram positives. Yeah. Gram positives. <laughs> we tried it with, we try, well, we don't do it with Subtilis because actually this is the classic way to get Subtilis to sporulate is mm. you, you resuspend it. It's the resuspension. And it's my favorite way because T0 is when you resuspend. You don't have to wait until they get to stationary phase and then figure out where your line bends over and call that T0. Um, we tried it with a lot of gram negatives. We tried it with uh, Pseudomonas and Acinetobacter, which anything we have in my lab that we're allowed to use <laughs> by WashU. Um, and we didn't see it with Pseudomonas. Uh, we thought maybe it's kind of irregularly with Pseudomonas. We didn't see it with Acinetobacter. We did see it with Klebsiella, though. So at least the enteric organisms seem to mm. do this response, at least the two that we looked at. Um, what about trying it with a cell that's in a V, B, and C state and then wash them so that they're in starvation conditions because V, B, and C has effectively switched everything off. And the way to get the population of bacterial cells into a V, B, and C state is you can expose it to an antibiotic, you can expose it to an oxidant like 50 part per million sodium hypochlorite, and you can set the population into a V, B, and C state, then wash them, and then ask the question, what happens with shrinkage? Right. So we have not tried that. Um, when I was at a different meeting, Ariane Bryle from um, Leiden, who does uh, tomography, cryo-electron tomography. So Ariane's work is really beautiful. She sent me a picture, kind of like I sent Casey a picture um, of cholera VBNCs, these viable but non cultural right. cholera. And this is a tomogram, which I show in my talks, and, and you could probably find it in her papers, but it had shrunk already. The VBNC had a very condensed looking cytoplasm, a large paraplasm. It was more of a rounded cell. It wasn't like our rod shaped cells. And one of the things that's a feature of these shrunk cytoplasms is the, the, we see these membrane foci. If we stain with mitotracker, which stains the inner membrane, we can see these membrane foci of the inner membrane as if it's kind of folded in on itself. And now we're getting kind of concentrated membrane fits. And in her tomogram, you can see that the inner membrane has made what in a tomogram would be the equivalent of these kind of foci. So we think that VBNCs mm -hmm. from cholera, at least, are essentially kind of in this shrunken state. Okay. So you've sort of, air quotes, done the experiment. <laughs> air quotes. Big, <laughs> big air quotes, yes. So I asked you um, to, to give us a couple of other papers uh, that kind of illustrate your interest, and you sent us two that you said you're very proud of. So let's let's go over those. Uh, one is the widely used antimicrobial triclosan induces high levels of antibiotic tolerance in vitro, reduces antibiotic efficacy up to a hundredfold in vivo. So maybe you could explain why you did this. Experiment. But I think we need to tell our listeners this is going to be frightening. So <laughs> well, it's <laughs> Halloween, right? Well, it's Halloween. This is going to drop on Halloween, Michelle. So. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, so nobody needs to be too frightened because triclosan has been pulled, at least in the United States. So U.S. listeners, triclosan is no longer allowed in yeah. at least toothpaste and I believe most cleaning products. But for a long time, actually, right about when our paper came out, I don't think we hastened its demise. But for a long time, triclosan is this antimicrobial. It's bacteria static at low concentrations, but it's bactericidal at high concentrations was added. So if you bought antimicrobial soap in like 2015, it would have had a ton of triclosan in it, which frankly was not useful because and so it's already antimicrobial, right? It literally breaks their membranes. You don't need to add triclosan, which would break their membranes more. I mean, once you <laughs> broke a membrane, you're done. Um, anyways, but at low concentrations, it's bacteria static. So it inhibits lipid synthesis, and that actually activates, you know, lots of pieces being connected together here. But there's other work from 
different labs. Uh, Emmanuel Bouveret has sort of done the most mechanistic work. She's, I think, now at Pasteur. Um, that you, if you add and if you inhibit lipid synthesis in E. coli, you actually accumulate this molecule PPGPP magic spot, which inhibits, kind of shuts down biosynthesis generally, and the cell enters a dormant state. And Emmanuel's work is gorgeous and seems to be um, via, so in Emmanuel's work, there's a protein called SPO-T, which can make PPGPP and also degrade PPGPP. And when you inhibit lipid synthesis, I just love this work, uh, the acyl carrier protein doesn't have a long lipid attached to it. And it turns out to interact with SPO-T and inhibit the hydrolase activity. So then you get all this PPGBP accumulating. So and, elegant. Yeah, so beautiful. And in this study that she had done, um, we had been doing work with lipid synthesis and cell size and sort of separate work. And I kind of knew that inhibiting lipid synthesis did this. And I kind of knew vaguely triclosan was a lipid synthesis inhibitor because of this other work my lab had done on cell size and whether the membrane is limiting for size. And I went to the dentist. This is where the story gets really weird. So I went to the dentist as one does every six months. And I was given in my goodie bag from the dentist, right? You always get a small thing of toothpaste and a toothbrush and dental floss and a little extra bag. You don't know what to do with. So my dentist was giving us Colgate Total Toothpaste, which they still sell and it's still antimicrobial, but no longer has triclosan using fluoride, high concentrations of sodium fluoride instead, but no longer has triclosan. And it had triclosan at the time in really high doses. And it was a really popular toothpaste. At the time, it was like number one on Amazon. Everybody loved it because your mouth felt so clean. Because <laughs> you're adding this antimicrobial. Anyways, I'm like looking at this and like my brain is like putting this together. I'm like, triclosan, lipid synthesis inhibitor. And then I'm like, we need to do this experiment. And so Corey Westfall, the one who did on the shrinkage paper, he was game. And so we basically started using triclosan because our idea was, okay, it's a lipid synthesis inhibitor that's an increased PPGPP, which makes cells dormant and has been associated with uh, persister cell formation, the formation of these cells that survive antibiotic challenge just because they're dormant, basically. Um, and we just started doing these experiments using triclosan and then challenging E. coli. We also did staph and urinary, UPEC, so the urinary pathogenic E. coli, um, with different antibiotics. And it was really clear that the triclosan was essentially at doses that would be, at the time, about 10% of the U.S. population had urine triclosan concentrations, because probably they were using total toothpaste um, or soaps or something. Um, at those concentrations of triclosan, it would protect the cell, the E. coli, the bacteria from challenge with uh, beta lactams. We use ciprofloxacin, which targets DNA replication, vancomycin, which is also a cell wall and staph. Um, and it was really and, protective. And this was orders of magnitude, right? It wasn't like eightfold or ninefold, like a hundredfold, a thousandfold. Yes. In vitro, I think we got Horrifying. a thousandfold. Yeah. So just imagine if you have a urinary tract infection and your physician prescribes an antibiotic like Cipro to treat the infection and you happen to be brushing your teeth with triclosan infused toothpaste, that antibiotic that you have just taken to effectively rid yourself of this infection is no longer going to be effective. A hundred percent. Exactly. And th this yeah. drives me crazy because of the antibiotic stewardship issues, all of the things that we're trying to uh, control in a hospital environment and brushing your teeth throws it out the window. <laughs> and, yeah. and they actually did this experiment to their credit in mice. Yes. A very experiment. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they didn't so, brush the teeth of the mice. <laughs> no, so anyway. Anna Flores Morales, again, wonderful faculty member at uh, now at Notre Dame, who was a postdoc in uh, the Hochran lab where they study urinary tract infections. So this is a perfect model, right? You can't always have a great model. Like, well, you know, wound models for triclosan are probably not that great. But, you know, we knew it was high in urine. And so she essentially developed a protocol to do this experiment in mice. And we saw a really big, so we, 
she fed mice, I think it was over 30 days with triclosan in their water. They didn't seem to care. And then she gave them urinary tract infections using human, so you pack, which a UT89, uh, so a urinary tract infection strain, and then gave them ciprofloxacin. And we saw a big increase in the numbers of bacteria recovered from urine and from bladder uh, in the triclosan fed mice versus the control. So yeah, <laughs> it was. Did you then have a conversation with your dentist? I did. I had multiple conversations this whole time. I, I gave him the paper. I printed it out for him. Um, but again, not too long after that paper was published, you know, it takes a while to do all these experiments. Uh, Colgate switched to using a, a fluoride version, a sodium fluoride version. Um, they got lots of complaints, I think, uh, originally because it didn't wasn't as good as the triclosan. Um, and also, it's slightly gritty, I think, were some of the comments I saw. Uh, you know, if you go to Amazon, you can see the comments. Um, but it's using sodium fluoride, which I think is an enolase inhibitor. It um, is. Sodium yeah. fluoride is an enolase inhibitor. Right. So anyhow, I teach dental students. So, <laughs> that's right. What effect has this, has this had? Is triclosan not used anymore, or what, what happens? Well, is so it- I think it was being phased out already because... There are some studies, not as clear, like not orders of magnitude, but there are some studies that it's an endocrine disruptor. Um, and it was also causing problems. So because it was so high and there was so much of it in human waste, um, it was actually causing, there's a couple of papers on sludge digesters, these big mm-hmm. things that you have to, you know, the, there mm-hmm. are a ton of microbes in there, all of which are sensitive to triclosan um, that are supposed to essentially break down the biomass in human waste or from the sewage. And they were not working as well because there was so much triclosan. So I think it was on its way out. If we'd been 10 years earlier, maybe we would have had a bigger impact ourselves. But, I mean, luckily it's gone now. So I think that's the most important thing. It is scary, Michelle. You're right. Yeah. But it, this this is definitely horror show t- because how many antibiotic-resistant microbes did we create? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, boy. Yeah. I know. <laughs> no, I mean, that's that's the frightening aspect because you're putting this selective pressure on top of something that's going to make them resistant. Yeah. No, it's not good. I mean, my house, we use this olive oil soap that just has nothing in it. And it, <laughs> <laughs> if it says antimicrobial, I stay away. Yeah. Well, it's good Some that bugs it's, are good for you. You want to ingest them and good get that microbiome. That Diverse. It, they did the right thing. They don't always do the right thing, right? Uh, so that's great. Let's let's uh, do the last paper uh, that you gave us. E life plasticity of E. coli cell wall metabolism promotes fitness and antibiotic resistance across environmental conditions. So, what's the backstory for that one? So the backstory for that one is that Elizabeth Muller, who was a grad student in my lab, who graduated mid COVID last year, um, she. It was also an experiment that started off to do one thing and ended up doing another. So as a um, rotation student, she had become, she was working on uh, the role of PPGPP actually in mediating, Mm. um, in mediating, sorry, in mediating cell growth and cell size. And she, along with a postdoc in the lab, and she had been adding glutamine. There are actually these old papers that suggest that if you increase PPGPP, you promote division and that you can suppress that by adding glutamine um, or glutamate. And she hadn't pH that solution and she saw a reduction in cell size. And so Mm -hmm. at first we weren't sure whether it had to do with the glutamine or whether it had to do with something else. And when she pH'd it, she realized that it was just the drop in pH that had reduced the size of the cells. So it was unrelated to her original experiment. It was just the sort of, you know, I'm doing this rotation project and I make this media. And because she was very careful and because she was, you know, did a great job at looking carefully at the cells, she found that, you know, it was a pretty big difference. It was a 20% reduction in in E. coli cell length, which you can see by eye. It's actually big enough that if you look, if you're used to looking at E. coli, you can see this difference. And so that was kind of where we saw it first. But then she had also been thinking a lot about the bacterial cell wall. And so not all bacteria, but E. coli and a lot of rod-shaped bacteria have a lot of proteins 
that are technically called penicillin binding proteins and are involved in cell wall synthesis. <laughs> um, and those proteins in the, so the proteins in the cytoplasm have basically a one-to-one -one ratio for every, to make a precursor for the cell wall, you know, which would be flipped out and then into the periplasm where you actually build the big structure. So to make that precursor, there's basically a one-to-one -one ratio of enzyme to reactions in the cytoplasm. But for all the proteins in the periplasm, it's closer to a four-to-one ratio. They're basically four enzymatically redundant proteins for every single reaction to make the big peptidoglycan structure, right, which is cross-linked and modified. And so this has been a question in the field, why have so much apparent redundancy? And Lizzie had this really amazing idea, which was maybe it's not redundancy in the true sense. It just looks like that at the neutral pH. You know, if we all do our experiments in, you know, LB at pH seven or even M9 at pH seven, if we're all doing our experiments in the same conditions, we never really think about what E. coli might see. And so E. coli in the body sees different things as it travels down the gut. Um, there are different pH conditions. If it finds itself in urine, urine pH can go from four to eight, depending on what the person is eating or drinking. Um, so the bacteria are constantly seeing these different environments. And so Lizzie's idea was maybe what we think of as redundancy is really just the bacteria optimizing its ability to grow under different conditions. Just like if you do biochemistry, right, you find the buffer that your protein's active at, maybe E. coli wants to make sure it has some protein, you know, this is such an essential part to build this cell wall. You want mm -hmm. the proteins to cover your bases. So you have one protein that's really good at pH five and a half and one that's good at pH eight, and you don't have to cover all of it with one protein. So rather than redundancy, versatility. Right, sort of versatility. Um, yeah, to be able to cover everything. Exactly. Redundancy is a word. I've had this conversation with multiple people. I feel like it's a, not a good word because it seems <laughs> nothing is redundant. The bacteria, right, is stripped out. If they've out hung onto it, it must be increasing <laughs> fitness in some exactly. situation. Exactly. It's not redundant. It's there for a reason. Yeah, we just can't figure it out and we call it redundant, right? right, right? right. <laughs> is this, do you think, a general property among bacteria? Because you just looked at E. coli, right? So um, Lizzie looked at E. coli, and she actually screened, used the KO collection to screen through all the supposed redundant ones, and she found a subset of proteins that seemed to be important at low mm -hmm. pH uh, and some that seemed to be important at high pH. And you can imagine there are all sorts of other conditions, high osmolarity, low osmolarity. There might be some temperature ones that we haven't even looked at. So in E. coli, we feel like we've just touched the surface. Um, we also saw, and I think this, we haven't done this directly, like we haven't done these screens for growth at different pH values in Klebsiella yet. But one of the things Lizzie found, which is probably related to this, is that at low pH, the sensitivity of E. coli to antibiotics, some antibiotics, not all of them, that sensitivity changes dramatically at low pH or high pH than from what it is at pH 7. And that probably reflects a mm. change in the activity of penicillin binding proteins that bind to beta-lactams in this case, or potentially maybe the efflux pumps that we've also seen this for ciprofloxacin, so the pumps that keep those antibiotics out. So, so Petra, sorry, your, your sorry. first love Bacillus subtilis has 16 <laughs> different penicillin binding proteins. Are you tempted to go in and look at what that versatility? <laughs> no, <laughs> don't touch it. Don't go there. <laughs> no, no. Well, I mean, no, I mean, E. coli has about the same. So I, we were, we really, I wanted to do bacillus, but bacillus turned out for all its ability to sporulate and be robust in that way, it hates changes in pH. So we couldn't even mm -hmm. do it. It just died when we shifted it, downshifted it. Um, but Klebsiella, actually, we see a very similar kind of pattern to what we see in E. coli. Um, and we mm -hmm. saw different patterns in Acinetobacter and Pseudomonas, which are very distant, not really closely related, although they're gammas. Um, and so we think that this is probably widespread, this kind of versatility, to use Michelle's word, which is actually perfect, pH versatility. Um, we think it's actually pretty widespread. 
Um, one of the kind of things that didn't quite make sense, though, was that Staphylococcus, which sees a lot of different pHs, has a very stripped down number of penicillin binding proteins. It's very limited. Mm-hmm. And so it, you know, I don't know, we didn't, we haven't tried knocking things out and stuff. It's kind of more challenging than Klebsiella. But, um, you know, it may not have, it may use some other uh, technique or approach or have solved the problem in a different way. Technique isn't the right word for bacteria. But. Do you think you could, say, knock out a gene encoding one of these, which is associated with a certain pH, and then put it in an animal and have it traverse, the, say, through the gut tract at different pHs and confirm that at that pH it no longer can grow because you've knocked out that particular gene? That would be a nice in vivo confirmation, right? Oh, yeah. No, exactly. I, I would really like to do that. Um, this is like a grant that Anna and I have thought about writing in the past and then COVID hit. And I think we both <laughs> got you know distracted with child care or whatever. And um, yeah. But I think it would be really good also to use this UTI model where we can actually modify yeah. the pH of the urine pretty right, right. easily and see whether some of these effects, because we saw like a 60 fold change in resistance to some antibiotics like cephalexin, which yeah, targets yeah. PBP3. Uh, if at five pH five and a half or pH five, which free coli is not some you know that unusual for it to see or grow it, and it grows pretty well. Um, to see such a big change mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in or big drop in its sensitivity to this drug that's used a lot is kind of a little scary. Maybe not as scary as triclosan, but um, I'd really like to know if that's happening in vivo. And the UTI model is obviously the most straightforward way to do that. I really appreciated your closing remark about um, we need to get away from using standard broth lab conditions <laughs> if we want to understand these bacteria. <laughs> Especially in, in, in under pathogenic conditions. Right. Yeah, maybe we're back to that urine experiment I did as a high school student. Yeah, yeah there you, you go. You know, your father may not have been off. <laughs> <laughs> we did see these same pH responses when we pH urine, sterile urine in my lab. So it, it is in vitro, at least. Urine or urine media is uh, still sensitive. <laughs> yeah. I presume of all of the three papers we talked about today, I would guess two out of the three you're still working on. Maybe not the tr- triclosan, but the others? Right. We are not working on the triclosan <laughs> one. <laughs> okay. All right. That is TWIM253. You can find the show notes, microbe.tv slash TWIM. Can send your questions and comments, twim at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Our guest today from Washington University, which is in St. Louis. It's not in Washington or Washington, D.C. St. Louis, Missouri. Petra Levin, thank you so much. It was a pleasure hearing about your work. Thank you, guys. It was really fun. Michelle Swanson's at the University of Michigan. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. Good to see you all. Elio Schechter is at Small Things Considered. Thanks, Elio. My pleasure. And Michael Schmitz at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. Have a good week. Michael, when it was one state, what was it called? Just Carolina? Carolina. When was that? What year? Before we were a country. Ah, before there were 13, uh, or how many? Before the 13 colonies. colonies. You know, when the... When the Lord proprietors were given the Carolinas. I see. Interesting. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.